readings. So let's talk about fluids. Uh, very, very important. The goal of the lecture is to clear some terms and get some basic concepts around which we can build physiology and pathology. Okay, so fluid is a solvent and that's what dissolves something which is called a solute. So solute is something that is dissolved. Solvent is something that it's dissolved in. For our body, the solvent, one of the big solvents is water and that's H2O. Compounds that are soluble in water are water-soluble compounds. Okay. Now what's an example of water-soluble? I can make salt. Salt is sodium chloride. So when I mix salt in water, what happens? Well, that salt breaks into sodium and chloride, which is its individual components. Now sodium has a positive charge and chloride has a negative charge. This positive charged malt atom is called a cation. Why? Because it's a positive charge and this looks like a cat to me. And the negative charge is called an anion. Okay. So that's an electrolyte. It's an electrically charged molecule. Now do all molecules dissolve in solvents? All solutes dissolve in solvents. All molecules dissolve in solvents and give you electrically charged molecules? The answer is no. I may have glucose. Glucose is what? C6H12O6. That's not, that doesn't break down into its constituents that are electrically charged. Okay? So that's something to remember. The other thing to notice is very interesting. I have one molecule of salt, NaCl, which breaks down into water. How many particles does it give us? It gives us two particles. They're electrically charged, but they're particles. However, glucose gives us only one particle. So remember that? It's going to come in handy a little later. Okay. Now what else do we have? We have lipids. Lipids are essentially fats. So these are organic compounds that are made of fatty acids and fluids and lipids are not friends. So in other words, if you put some oil on some water, right, it's going to float on top. It will not mix. So fats are insoluble in water, okay, and water is insoluble in fats, okay. However, there are some compounds that are soluble in fats, right and they're called lipid soluble just like there were some compounds that are soluble in water okay easy right we talk about proteins right which is chain of amino acids okay and uh, the way to think about proteins is they do some active stuff I am active I move around I have protein okay the table that I am working off of is not active, doesn't have protein, okay? Now, proteins serve a very important function. And what's that? Well, so I have, you know, in my cell, you know, I have a cell wall. So what does this cell wall look like? cell wall looks like this and when you look even more closely at one of these this is what it actually looks like it looks like there is it looks like a tadpole okay and one end of the tadpole is lipid soluble remember we just talked about it a second ago and the other side of it is water soluble so one thing can dissolve in 
salt, the other thing, the one thing can dissolve in water, the other thing is more likely to dissolve in fats. Okay? And then you actually have the same molecule, but the water soluble end attaches to the water soluble end, and the other end is lipid soluble. So the lipid soluble uh, part is the part that faces inside of the cell and outside of the cell. And when you stack it, that's what it looks like. This is the external part of the cell. This is the internal part of the cell. Okay. Now, lipid-soluble compounds, because it's lipid-soluble parts are there on either side of the cell wall, they go through the cell wall. They don't have an issue. The water-soluble compounds, they can't. Why? Because you have lipid-soluble compounds lipid soluble part on either side of the cell wall it likes lipids it doesn't like things that are dissolved in water okay so now the question is i have some water soluble stuff that i gotta get inside the cell okay how can i do that well i have these proteins that provide path for these things to go through these water soluble compounds, these water soluble molecules that are so important to go through, these are called channels. Sometimes these water soluble compounds need a boat to carry them across the channel. So, you know, it's just like uh, there's a river, right? And one has to cross the river, so one can cross the river by wading through the river or sometimes they need a little boat this is my boat that carries them through the river so the boat here would be a carrier molecule so the channel is a protein or carrier is a protein and the goal is to get water soluble things through the cell wall inside the cell from inside to outside and from outside to inside okay so now that we're talking about how things move right let's expand on that concept a bit more okay and so there's two reasons there's there's two things that can happen when things move so things move from to okay so they go from their source to the destination Okay, that's one. Okay. Then, what else? Well, if I have a solute and I have a solvent which gives me a solution, right? You have a few things that can happen. Either the solute can move or the solvent can move or both can move or none can move, right? easy right so that's two third what's the third part of this well I can move and that can lead to things getting equal or balanced or things can move to make things more imbalanced which is they set up a gradient or increase the gradient. So how do I think through this? Uh, let's say there's a party. Okay, so destination is party. Okay, and everybody, the source is everybody in the neighborhood. So when everybody in the neighborhood goes through to the party, right, what happens to the party? There's a lot of people there, and, and people are continuing to pour in, right? That's setting up a gradient, <laughs> okay? When the party's over, they all go back. And now we're making sure they're equally distributed within the neighborhood instead of being there in the one house, okay? Makes sense, right? Think about parties, you can learn a lot of things. So let's expand on this concept and talk a little bit more about 
how things move. And we'll first start with balancing things out. So remember they were at the party. Now they want to go back home. And we want everybody to be balanced. Everything to be balanced. Everybody to be properly distributed through the neighborhood. Okay. So again, we'll start with two compartments because it's a source and destination. Okay. We'll start with the solution, solute and solvent. We'll choose salt, sodium chloride as a solute and then water as a solvent. So it's going to be a sodium solution. We have two compartments. We have compartment A and compartment B. <clears throat> the difference is, the sameness is both have one liter of water which is solute. The difference is one compartment have one kilogram of salt, the other one has four kilograms of salt. Okay, and let's go through some scenarios. So the first scenario is I have an impermeable membrane between it, between the two compartments. Now, solute, which is my sodium chloride, will that go through? No. Solvent, water, is that going to go move any ways? No. Nope. Okay, that's easy. Okay, now I remove that impermeable membrane and put in a semi-permeable membrane. It's the same thing, one kilograms, four kilograms per liter per liter. Okay, and now I see the water starts to move. Okay, I see that the water is starting to move. And the water moves from a less concentrated solution to a more concentrated solution. Okay, so what's concentration? Concentration is solute mass, mass of the solute, one kilograms, right, in this compartment per liter. That's volume of solvent. Concentration is mass over volume, mass of solute over volume of solvent. So water moves from where it's where uh, the solution is less concentrated to where the solution is more concentrated. We'll talk a bit more about it. But essentially water moves from where so a less concentrated solution would have a more more water. More concentrated solution would have more solute or less solvent or less water. So essentially, water moves from where it's more to where it's less. <laughs> Easy, right? Through a semi-permeable membrane. That's called osmosis. Okay. Now, I remove all the membranes. And I just connect the two compartments together. What's going to happen? Well, now, the water doesn't move. But it's actually the solute that moves. So remember sodium chloride? And remember we had 1 kg per, four, per liter and we had 4 kgs per liter in this compartment. So now it's actually the solute that moves from where solute is more, which is this compartment, to where solute is less, which is this compartment. So solute moves from where solute is more to where solute is less. Let's go through this one more time. Remember two compartments, one kilogram per liter of salt, four kilograms in one liter of uh, water, okay? Impermeable membrane, nothing moves. Semi-permeable membrane, water moves from where it's more, okay? Which is a less concentrated solution to where it's less or a more concentrated solution. Remember concentration is solute mass, divided by volume of the solvent. And then lastly, if I remove the semi-permeable membrane and it has no membrane, water doesn't move. It's actually the solute that moves from where it's more. So that would be the four kilograms per liter to the second compartment where it's less, which is one kilogram and four liters. Okay. So this is called diffusion. This is called diffusion. Again, we talked about no movement, osmosis, and diffusion. That's to balance things out. 
What about gradient? So gradient is where we are using some kind of active transport with energy. That's why it's active. Okay. And the goal is to move the solute. So remember salt here? From where it's less to where it's more. Okay. Ah. So A, impermeable membrane, nothing will really move. So I'm going to go still move it. Okay. And I want to move it from where the concentration of the solute is less to where concentration of the solution, the solute is more. So remember the party where we all want to get to the party. So, you know, we all get ready for the party. So it's an active process. You know, we shine our shoes, we brush our teeth, and we are at the party, and then we get tired, and, you know, and then we just get back home. But getting to the party, we've got to do more stuff uh, to look good for the party. That's what active transport is. We are moving from our distributed neighborhood to one house. Now, the other thing that's there is that when we are setting up a gradient, we have to have an impermeable membrane. Why is that? Because if I have, if I have a semi-permeable membrane or no membrane, the active transport is going to move this stuff over to the other compartment. Okay? But the osmosis and the diffusion processes that we covered here will try to balance it out or equalize it. So the impermeable membrane stops that from happening okay so again we talked about osmosis diffusion and how to set up gradient and the difference between them okay. now next thing we talk about are compartments in the body okay so th there's some very easy compartments so you know there's blood vessels where the blood is flowing Inside those blood vessels, that space is called intra in tra in blood vessels vascular in the blood vessel intravascular space. Okay, and then you have inside the cell, which is intracellular space. Okay, and then you have extracellular space, which is outside the cell. So you have inside the cell, outside the cell. Now, outside the cell can be inside the blood vessel, or outside the cell can be something which is space that is not in the blood vessel, but, uh, you know, it's still outside the cell. So, this is how we divide it. We say, okay, we have intracellular, and then we have extracellular. An extracellular space is divided into space inside the blood vessel, which is vascular space, intravascular, or interstitial space, which is extracellular, but it's not vascular. Okay, so this is how I break it. This is very important. So you have compartments. So you have inside the cell intracellular, outside the cell, which is extracellular, and then that can be divided into inside the blood vessel intravascular and extracellular space outside the blood vessel which is interstitial. Now there are actually some body cavities. So these are two spaces inside and outside the cell, right? Inside the cell, outside the cell, inside the blood vessel and interstitial space. Now even within organs there's actually lining of certain organs and this actually is another space that's there in the body and it serves a purpose and this is called a third space because inside is number one outside is number two and so this is a third space okay or body cavity you have pleura peritoneum, pericardium, this, these are some of the examples of body cavities, the third spaces, okay? So that gives us a good idea of compartments within body, okay? Now, let's say I have 
I take somebody's blood. Okay. Where do I take their blood from? I take it from a blood vessel and I run it through a machine. I measure things within the blood vessel. Sodium, potassium, hemoglobin. What values am I measuring? Okay, so now we have ICF, intracellular, IC intracellular, IV intravascular, IS interstitial. So measuring intravascular volume, right? Now there are certain things where intravascular values equals interstitial values. So if you're measuring blood, let's say, or hemoglobin, generally that is contained within the blood vessel. So that's going to be intravascular value. But if you're measuring some electrolytes like sodium, potassium, chloride, glucose, this is going to uh, be value that we're measuring in the blood, but the volume, but the levels in the blood are the same as the levels in the interstitial space. Okay, so essentially we are measuring intravascular space, but it's the same as interstitial space. Okay, so here's the two concepts around it. Okay, now, now that we have talked about what some basics are, solute, solvent, we've talked about how they move, right? We've talked about compartments in the body, right? Right? So now let's talk more about compartments and the lectures about fluids. So we'll talk about fluids or water solvent in different compartments. Okay? So the first thing, how much fluid do you have? Usually males, 60% of the body weight, total body weight is water. Females are slightly less. It's about 50% because of increased fat. The more fat you have, the less water you have. Babies have increased percentage of total body water, uh, total body weight as, uh, as water. Okay. Um, so let's say I'm 100 kgs. And I'm a male, approximately 60% or 60 kilograms, and let's just for simplicity say 60 liters of that is going to be water. Okay? Total body water. So again, I was 100 kilograms, 60% or 60 liters. Okay? Of that is total body water. Which space has the most? amount of this total body water. Two-thirds of this is inside the cell. Remember? Inside the cell, blood vessel, intravascular, intracellular, interstitial. So again, two-thirds of water, which is 40 liters in this case, is going to be inside the cell. 20 liters is going to be outside the cell. Now, 75% of what is outside the cell is going to be, 75% of this is going to be interstitial. So that's 15 liters here. And then one fourth or 25% of what's in the extracellular space is in the blood vessel or vascular space, so that's five liters. Okay, so that's how we break it up. So how can this question be asked in a different way? Well, what if I have to increase the extracellular fluid, the the intravascular fluid, add one liter to it? Right. How much fluid do I need to give somebody? So if everything is normal and everything moves ideally, essentially this would be 25%, right? So they would need another three liters which would fill up their interstitial space, right? 
okay and that would combine give it four liters of extracellular space right right now that's just one third okay so two-thirds of this is going to be eight liters okay so essentially if I have to raise somebody's plasma in this case by a liter I'd need to give them 12 liters which is 8 liters plus 4 liters so again because 1 liter of plasma for increase of 1 liter of plasma there's going to be a distribution of 75 percent of that or 3 times that amount is going to be distributed in the interstitial space so that's 3 liters so combine extracellular fluid is 4 liters intracellular is twice that of extracellular so that's 8 liters so if I give somebody 12 liters of fluid right what's going to happen 8 liters is going to go in the cell 4 liters is going to go outside the cell and on the outside the cell 75 percent of this is going to go interstitial and 1 liter is going to go intravascular okay so in this video uh, we talked about different elements lipids fluid carbohydrates electrolytes lipids proteins cell wall carriers how things move with balancing things out and we talked about osmosis diffusion and then we talked about setting up a gradient okay and then we talked about different compartments intracellular extracellular intravascular interstitial and this third space we talked about when we are measuring somebody's blood what are we measuring and that for some things it's what we find in the blood in the intravascular space for some things it's intravascular and interstitial and then we talked about different fluids in different compartment and how much goes where so continuing on continuing on we'll talk more about osmolarity osmolality and tonicity in the next lecture